How about those crazy Windows PowerShell help files? Brackets, angle brackets, different sets of parameters, what's it all mean? Well, let's walk through this real quick. First of all, what you're looking at is the short help for the get service commandlet. Notice that there are three parameter sets. Now, parameter sets are kind of interesting in that you can use any or all of the parameters within one set, but you can't mix and match. Some parameters, like computer name, may appear in multiple parameter sets, and that's fine. But the deal here is, for example, if I decided to use the name parameter, that locks me into this parameter set, because name is unique across the parameter sets. I could not use both name and input object at the same time, because those are across different parameter sets. So what these brackets mean, there's, there's two meanings for square brackets in these help files. When there are two square brackets right up against one another, it means that this parameter will accept one or multiple strings. Hash tables are a special form of array within Windows PowerShell. In other languages or other environments, you may also hear them called associative arrays or even dictionary objects. They're really built around a simple structure. In Windows PowerShell, you start with the at sign, which one of its functions is to be an array operator. Just tells PowerShell that you're defining an array. Hash tables are defined inside curly braces, and they can simply consist of one or more key equals value pairs separated by semicolons. So you can have as many of these key equals value pairs as you like. The last one doesn't get a semicolon at the end, it just gets the closing brace. Here's an example. I'm going to store this hash table in the dollar sign hash variable. So I'm setting dollar sign hash equal to, there's that at sign, and here are the curly braces that enclose my three key equals value pairs. In this first one, the key is server one, and the value is this IP address. The second one's key is server two, with an IP address. And the third one's key is server three, and its value is this IP address. When I hit enter and define that hash table, I can then refer to the individual values by accessing their keys. Hash.server1 gets me the IP address for server1. If I want to ping that real quick, I just ping hash.server1. And it feeds that IP address directly to the external ping command. And as you can see, that server is not responding. So I might want to look into that pretty quickly. Hash tables are used in several different places. Some of the most common places you'll see hash tables in Windows PowerShell are with the select object and format table commandlets. In fact, we'll have another thing on those, another video on those that you can look at. They're designed to take a very specifically formatted hash table, meaning they predefine the keys they want to see, and they let you provide the values for those keys. Hash tables have a lot of different uses in PowerShell, and you'll see them in different examples you run across on the internet. It's important just to understand what you're looking at. The at sign defines the beginning of an array, and for hash tables, that array is contained in curly braces. Inside the curly braces, it's simply key equals value pairs. Once you've mastered that, you'll recognize hash tables when you see them, and you'll kind of be on your way to using them in more situations. Pipeline parameter binding is probably one of the most powerful aspects of Windows PowerShell. You can find documentation for pipeline parameter binding by looking at the full help for a particular command let's help. When you get to the per parameter breakdown, you'll find pipeline binding under the accept pipeline input. If it's true, you'll be told which type of pipeline binding this parameter works with. There are two options by property name, such as on this computer name parameter of get service, and by value, such as on this name property of get service. As you can see here, it's possible to accept input by value and by property name. Here's how by value works. Let's say I use a command that like get content, which produces string objects. When I pipe those string objects to another commandlet like get service, it has to decide what to do with those input objects. In this case, because they're a string, it will attach them to the name parameter, which accepts pipeline input by value. Because the name parameter accepts strings and the input objects are strings, 
the data type or value type is what connects the input object to the name parameter. Even though other parameters, like computer name, may also accept a string, they do not bind pipeline input by value. They bind it by property name, which is slightly different. Only one parameter at a time can bind a particular pipeline input by value. In other words, if the name parameter is accepting strings by value, it is the only parameter which may do so. Other parameters may accept pipeline input by value, provided they accept a different type of data. Nobody else can accept a string. Pipeline parameter binding by property name works slightly differently. Let's say that I'm importing a CSV file that has two column names. The first column is computer name, and the second column is description. Import CSV will place objects into the pipeline with these two properties. So for each line in the CSV file, an object will be produced that has a computer name property and a description property. When I pipe those objects to another commandlet, such as new PS session, it needs to know what to do with those input objects. In the case of new PS session, the computer name parameter binds pipeline input by property name, same as it does with the get service commandlet's computer name parameter. In this case, because I have an input object property named computer name, in other words, the property name matches the parameter name, the computer names from the CSV file will be matched to the computer name parameter of new PS session. Let's take a look at that example and see how it actually works. I'll ask for help on new PS session and I need to make sure I'm reading the full help. When I get to the computer name parameter, you can see that it does accept pipeline input by value. It also accepts by property name. By property name is what we'll be using. I have a CSV file called computers.csv and it contains three lines. As you can see, each of those has been created into an object in the pipeline and the column headings or field names within the CSV file itself determine these property names. So each of these three objects has a computer name property and a description property. I can pipe those directly to new PS session and it will attempt to create a new PS session to each of these three computers by attaching the computer name property to its computer name parameter. Now some of those computers weren't able to be reached and that's okay. The command that will keep going and it will create a session for the one it was able to reach. Since I don't plan on using those sessions right away, I'm going to go ahead and remove them. So that's pipeline binding by property name. The trick is that the input object property must exactly match the parameter name that you expect to hook it up to. Now this isn't the case for every single commandlet. For example, if we look at the help for get wmy object, again making sure that we look at the full help, when we get down to the computer name property, can see that for this particular commandlet, the computer name proper parameter does not accept pipeline input. So I couldn't use that same trick with this particular commandlet. Unfortunately, the, uh, the use of pipeline input binding is a little bit inconsistent across different commandlets. So let's look at how this might work with a by value parameter binding. I have a text file called services.txt and it contains the name four different services. By piping those to get service, I can have the get service commandlet get just those services. What's happening is that these four strings are being bound by value to the name parameter of get service. So I'm telling it the name. Man, look at this command line. This is a doozy. And it does something pretty incredible. It's grabbing pieces of information from two different WMI classes, Win32 Operating System and Win32 BIOS, and it's combining that information into a custom table output. But man, look at all that crazy punctuation. What's it doing? Well, there's basically three types of punctuation that are used inside Windows PowerShell commands. The first one is 
square brackets. Now we're talking about punctuation as it's used in the command line itself. The help files use punctuation for slightly different notation to denote things like optional parameters and so forth. So for right now, we're strictly talking about how it's used in commands. And square brackets are only used in one way. These are used for arrays. Now, what's an array? Well, array, or a collection, is simply a bunch of something. Uh, for example, here in the command line, if I uh, use a variable, like dollar sign services, and I set it equal to get service, well, get service got all the services on my computer. And so that collection of objects is now inside the dollar sign services variable. And I can use a square bracket to access the first one, or the second one, or the last one, or the second to the last one, and like that. So that's the only thing square brackets are actually used for in an actual command. Now the next one is probably going to be these little parentheses characters right here. Parentheses are used for order of operation, or precedence. Now you're probably already familiar with this from your basic high school math. If I have an equation like uh, 4 times 2 plus 1, um, mathematical order of operation tells me that I do the multiplication first, 4 times 2, so that's 8, then plus 1 equals 9. And that's awesome. However, if I use parentheses, it could be 4 times 2 plus 1, and I do the parentheses first. So that's 3, 4 times 3 is 12. So you can come up with completely different answers. And parentheses have the exact same purpose in PowerShell. The only difference in PowerShell is that you can put something something a little bit more complex than just a mathematical operation in there, but it, it kind of relates back to the same idea. See what I did here? I, I did the what was inside the parentheses first. So the entire parentheses as a unit represents the number 3, and that's why I did that. So the parentheses are, are creating this sort of self-contained little bit over here that is equivalent, in this case, to 3. Now well, the same type of thing happens in Windows PowerShell. If you look at where I used the parentheses right here, they're containing this entire command. Get WMI object win32 BIOS from the computer name in dollar sign underscore dot underscore underscore server. So whatever this command results in will replace this entire parenthetical expression. Now this command is going to retrieve the win32 BIOS object from whatever computer I specified. So this entire parenthetical expression will represent the retrieved Win32 BIOS object. And then I've typed a period and then the name of a property that I want to access from that object. You'll see something kind of similar. Um, let's say I, I have a file called computers.txt and it includes one computer name per line of that text file. That means I could do something like get WMI object Win32, oh, let's say logical disk from the computer name, and instead of specifying a computer name manually, I'm going to use a parenthetical expression. I'm going to say get content from computers.txt. Again, that parenthetical expression represents the results of the command inside. So all of this will be replaced by whatever get content computers.txt returns. In this case, it'll be a list of names, so this entire parenthetical expression will represent that list of names, and they'll be passed as the value to the computer name parameter. Now, the last bit of punctuation you're probably going to notice here is these curly braces. Um, don't call those brackets, definitely call them braces, because we've got a square bracket, and you start using that word too much, but here's what those dudes mean. The curly braces in Windows PowerShell are typically used to enclose code. In other words, some executable expression. Um, technically, they're usually called a script block. And the only other time you'll see them used is when they're being used to define a hash table. And a hash table, also called a dictionary object or uh, just a dictionary, is simply a set of key value pairs. So uh, you might have something like name equals Don, site equals contact, and these are the keys, and these are the values. Well, if you look at that expression that I've created here, this super duper command line, you can see that one of the things I've defined is a hash table. 
So it starts with this at sign, and then these curly braces all the way down to here enclose the complete hash table. The first key in the hash table is label, and it is being set equal to the value BIOS serial. So that's the first key value pair. One of the most confusing parts about using Windows PowerShell is when you can and cannot use this dollar sign underscore. What's it mean? When is it useful? Well, here's the deal. Generally speaking, you're going to see that used with commandlets like where object and for each object. The general rule is that any place a commandlet accepts a script block parameter, then dollar sign underscore will work inside that script block. For example, get service pipe to where object and then where object accepts a script block, which means it's enclosed in curly braces and contains some executable PowerShell statement such as dollar sign underscore dot status equals running. Here, the dollar sign underscore always represents a placeholder. In other words, it's saying I want to refer to whatever object was piped into this commandlet. Since the objects being piped in in this example are service objects, then dollar sign underscore will represent a service object. By following dollar sign underscore with a period, we can access its members or its properties and methods. In this case, we're accessing the status property of the service object and we're checking to see if it equals running or not. You can see lots of other examples of commandlets that accept uh, script blocks as input parameters by just looking at their help. For example, help for each object shows us that it actually accepts three different script blocks, one for processing, one for beginning, and one for ending. Inside the script block, the dollar sign underscore character acts as a placeholder for whatever objects have been piped into for each object. If you look at the help for where object, you'll see that it also accepts a script block. And inside that script block, dollar sign underscore will act as a placeholder for whatever objects were piped into where object. You can't just use dollar sign underscore directly at the command line. It doesn't mean anything unless PowerShell is specifically looking for it and filling in the blank with whatever object was piped in. I can't just take a generic object and pipe it to dollar sign underscore because Windows PowerShell isn't looking for it there. It only looks for the dollar sign underscore placeholder inside these script blocks. So that's probably the easiest way to remember when you can use it and what it's for. It only works inside the script block of a commandlet parameter and it represents whatever objects were piped into that commandlet. Once you kind of remember those two simple rules, it's easier to figure out when and where you can successfully use the dollar sign underscore placeholder character.